The Chessmen of Doom by John Belair's Chapter 9. As the gray, drizzly morning dawned, three very wet and bedraggled figures sat perched on an overturned rowboat. Johnny was at one end, Fergie was at the other, and the professor crouched in the middle with the canoe paddle in his hand. His hair was sopping wet and was plastered to his forehead. And there was a very crabby expression on his face. I feel absolutely wretched, growled the old man. On the other hand, we are still alive, so I guess we ought to be grateful for small favors. How are you boys doing? Pretty well, prof, said Fergie wearily. I'll bet you didn't know that a rowboat can hold more people upside down than it can right side up. I read that somewhere. I'll file that little piece of information away, said the professor dryly. He twisted his head around and peered at Johnny, who was straddling the stern of the boat. How about you, John? Johnny felt waves of nostalgia. Uh, Johnny felt waves of nausea rising inside him, but he fought them down, swallowed hard, and stared straight ahead. I think I can hang on for a long time, he said bravely. As long as there aren't any big waves, I mean. Do you suppose anyone will come res to rescue us? As if in answer, a droning motorboat sound began in the distance. As it drew closer, it drew closer, and then a white and blue official-looking speedboat appeared out of the, out of the mist. A big swirling searchlight was mounted on the front, and the words Stone Arabia Police Department were stenciled neatly on the side under a silver star. A cop in a rain slicker stood on the bow, and he held a megaphone in his hand. Do you need any, do you need help? He bellowed. The professor couldn't help laughing. That must be one of the most idiotic questions I have ever heard in my life, he said between cackles. <laughs> Does it look like we're on a boating expedition? He yelled back. Yes, of course we need help. The police boat pulled alongside the upside-down rowboat and its three soaked occupants. One at a time, the boys and the professor were pulled into the other vessel. Gratefully, they sank onto the ribbed bottom. Many thanks, officer, sighed the professor. I am very happy to see you. The policeman with the megaphone handed out blankets to the three wet, shivering people that he had rescued. Then, the police boat did a very neat U-turn and went plowing away at high speed toward the shore. That evening, the professor and the boys were sitting in the study of the old mansion. A roaring fire was going in the fireplace, and everyone had a mug of hot cider in his hand. The boys looked dejected, while the professor looked mad enough to chew nails. For a long time, there was no sound but the ticking of the gloomy black marble clock on the mantel and the crackling of twigs in the fireplace. Finally, the professor spoke. Well, it was a nice try, he said sourly, but I guess I should have expected that the mustache monster would beat us to the punch. He probably guessed that we would try to do what we would try to do and conjured up that chapel illusion and threw us in the storm for good measure. I have heard tales of sorcerers who could command the winds and the waves, but I never believed it until now. Fergie made a squinchy face and stared into the fire. He was trying hard to be skeptical. Are you sure that storm was his doing? He asked with a sudden search and glance at the professor. I mean, it could have been a coincidence, couldn't it? The professor stiffened. Oh, sure, he said in a strained voice. That storm was a mere coincidence. It was also a coincidence, a coincidence that those comets in the sky were out during the magical ceremony that our friend was trying to perform here in the Tower Room Mansion. Look, Byron, I am as confused as you are about the things that have been going on around here lately. But I can tell you one thing. Dear Mr. Stallybrass may be as batty as a bedbug, but he has a lot of power and he's not shy about using it. Those lights in the sky may or may not have been comets. The storm may or may not have been summoned up by witchcraft, but something is going on. And it is evil. For that reason, I think we are in great danger as long as we stay here. We have been up to bat twice against Mr. Stallybrass, and each time we have struck out. I think we'd better escape while we still can. Johnny's jaw dropped. He put his cider mug on the coffee table and stared at the professor. You mean you're going to just go home? He asked in amazement. The professor nodded. Yes, that is exactly what I am going to do, and you two are going with me because you really have no choice in the matter. I hate to sound like a tyrant, but I'm doing this for your good and for mine. We're like a bunch of people who are trying to put out a forest fire with water pistols. The chances of succeeding are pretty. The chances of success are pretty slim. Johnny and Fergie looked quickly at each other. Each one knew what the other was thinking. The professor had. The professor really had not given up. He probably had some secret plan for settling Mr. Stally Brash's hash. But he wanted to protect the boys, so he was pretending to give up. Luckily, the professor did not notice the looks the boys were giving each other. He was too busy trying to light an old meerschaum pipe that he had found in, in Perry's desk. 
Johnny took a sip of cider and paused to let the warmth flow into his body. Are, are you going to give up the inheritance? He asked hesitantly. He knew that the professor had to stay at the estate until Labor Day to collect the $10 million Perry had left him. Inheritance, schmimheritance said the professor with a shrug. I have enough money to last me the rest of my life, so I don't need to be greedy. I'd hope that I could use some of the dough to provide for your college education, John, but, well, I'd rather make sure that you and Byron stay among the living. Don't lose any sleep over the lost money. It probably had a curse on it anyway. The boys and the professor talked on until they were so weary that they saw spots dancing in front of their eyes. Then they gulped the last of their cider, turned out the lights in the study, and dragged themselves upstairs to their beds. In spite of the frightening adventure that they had had, they all slept soundly. On a chilly, sunlit day in August, the three travelers said goodbye to the estate of Stone Arabia and its haunted tower room. A hint of fall was in the air, and red maple leaves sifted down onto the porch as the professor turned the key in the lock of the wide front door. The boy stood beside him, and the professor's maroon Pontiac waited in the driveway. Its trunk and back seat were crammed with camping equipment, bedding, canned goods, and other odds and ends. For a long time, the professor stood before the locked door with his arms folded. He was trying to remember if he had done anything that was necessary for shutting the house down. There's always something that you forget to do, said the little voice in the back of his head. But right now, he was not terribly interested in little nagging voices. He wanted to leave. And so we say farewell to ghastly acres, he said. And he flipped the keys into the air, catching them behind his back. He turned and trotted back, and he turned and trotted down the creaky porch steps. The boys followed him. Are you going to try to follow up that clue that the ghost gave me? Asked Johnny eagerly. I mean, the one about Crazy Annie who has the key? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yes, John, I know what you're talking about, said the professor primly. But you must remember that ghosts say lots of odd things that ordinary humans can't possibly understand. Who is Crazy Annie anyway? And what kind of key is the ghost talking about? Is it a door key or a slate key? The key, of G, the key of G, Francis Scott key, or what? You could spend hours or even years trying to figure out the crazy Annie clue. And in the end, you would probably come up with nothing. When I was young, I tried to solve impossible riddles, but I won't try that kind of foolishness now. Again, Fergie and Johnny looked at each other. They were convinced the professor was lying to them. When he got home, he was probably going to turn the world upside down to find out who crazy Annie was and what her key was supposed to be. Well, if he thought he was going to leave Johnny and Fergie behind while he searched for clues, he had another think coming. And we will pause there.